Okay, next we're going to go through uh, the structures on the sheep brain that you are required to know. Uh, note that on your lab, there are parentheses with asterisks in it, and the asterisks tell you that you should also be able to find it on the sheep brain. Previously, we did the meninges. So what we're going to do is take a tour of the external anatomy of the brain and then the internal anatomy of the brain as we're looking at it. So, so on the sheep brain, because they don't stand erect, their brain and spinal cord are still very linear. Where in humans, because we stand erect, our brain has to actually curve downward like this uh, in that posture. So, so the thing about the sheep brain is a little different is how linearly organized it is versus ours. So when we're looking at the lobes again, then the front lobe of the brain is the uh, frontal lobe of the brain, the middle lobe of the brain is the parietal lobe of the brain. Here is that central sulcus that we were looking at on humans separating the two. This posterior lobe of the brain here is the occipital lobe of the brain, and then the, ant the lateral lobe of the brain here is the temporal lobe. So again, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal. And then this large structure is the cerebellum. So remember I said that when you look at the size of a sheep cerebellum relative to their, their cranium, it's much larger than ours relative. So it's a highly important area for, for coordinated uh, muscle activity in, in the brain itself. So what we did when we cut this sheep brain is we cut down through a groove that separated the two hemispheres together. So what we've done is we've separated it via the longitudinal fissure that would have been here, and you'd be able to see it before you cut your brain in half like this. So just like in ours, although when you look at the, the pattern, there are less folding on a sheep brain, so that's why they don't take anatomy and you take anatomy is you've got a lot more folding, a lot more cerebral cortex than a sheep has. But again, the ridges on the brain are gyrus. The little grooves in the brain are sulcus. And it's another pattern of increasing surface area. Remember, gray, air, gray matter is on the surface of the brain. So by highly folding our brain, we've greatly increased our surface area of our brain. So... As we look at the cerebellum, remember if we pull the cerebellum down, we can actually see two bumps. We would have two bumps on both sides. So this again is our corpora quadrigemini. And again, the superior colliculus is the upper bump. The inferior colliculus is the lower bump. You might recall that in the human brain, the, the upper bump was smaller, the lower bump was larger. In other words, the superior colliculus was smaller the inferior colliculus was larger. In a sheep brain that's reversed, the superior colliculus is larger, the inferior colliculus is smaller, so they're more visual and less auditory. They don't have elaborate speech patterns like we have. They say, bah, and so that auditory input is less, less important to them. So as we look at the brain stem itself, then uh, inferior to the cerebellum, we would find the medulla oblongata here leading into the spinal cord here, and then this enlargement here above the medulla oblongata or anterior to it is the pons. And if we pull this area back, we can see that there's a ridge in here, and again that ridge is associated with connecting the brain stem to this. So what we're seeing is the cerebral peduncles again. Now if we look at the front of the brain, the other thing we'll see is that olfaction is very important to sheep. Uh, and so the olfactory bulb on a sheep is actually much larger than ours. Uh, and then we would have a tract going back from that toward the brain itself. And then suspended inferiorly off the brain is the pituitary gland. And then the pituitary gland is attached via the hypothesis that's, or the infundibulum, excuse me, that's been actually torn right here. Uh, but it's keeping this in place. And then if we find our pituitary gland, then there's an enlargement just posterior to it right here. 
which is the mammillary body on a sheep. Ours are much more pronounced than than the sh than the sheep brain uh, is. If you look at a mid sagittal section of the brain, we can see the same structures that we talked about in a human brain. So a sheep brain is much smaller than ours, but it is a cheap uh, resource that allows us to see some characteristics that are similar. So this was that half moon structure that we talked about in the brain, which is the corpus callosum. This downward projection right here is the fornix. So the tissue that's between the two right here is the septum pellucidum. So if I actually tear the septum pellucidum and we open it up, now you can see that there was a cavity back behind the septum pellucidum, and that's our lateral ventricle that we're now seeing. So as we move beneath the fornix, then we'll see a large rounded area, which is the intermediate mass of the thalamus. And it's quite large in sheep compared to humans. And again, it connects the, the thalamus, which is the tissue that's, that's lateral to this. Uh, and then if this is the thalamus, this area is the hypothalamus. And remember, the uh, infundibulum is attached to the hypothalamus so that there's the relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So the depressed area we're seeing here is actually the third ventricle of the sheep brain. The area between the cerebellum and the back of the medulla oblongata and the pons is the fourth ventricle of the sheep brain. And we actually have this little groove here that's connecting the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. So what we're seeing right here that I just ran the, the probe through is the cerebral aqueduct of the sheep brain. And then again, in the cool pattern that exists within the cerebellum, it looks like we have a little tree in our brain. So the white areas make up what we call the arbor vitae, and then the folding pattern of gray matter, which greatly increases the surface area of that gray matter, is called the fola. So as we look at cranial nerves, we're only going to cover four on the sheep brain. The others are, are fairly difficult to find. Uh, So the olfactory bulb is where nerve one becomes part of the brain. So the olfactory nerve would be associated with the olfactory bulb. As we look here, this nerve that's been cut right here was coming back from the eye. So that's the optic nerve. And when we study the eye, we'll find out that the part of the optic nerve crosses. So this thing that's been cut here is called the optic chiasm, which is where part of the optic nerve crosses. Now remember in the human brain, we went from superior to, to inferior. We're going to go from, from anterior to posterior as we do this. So if we find the pituitary gland here, we move it out of the way, we can see this white band right in here. And that is actually the third uh, cranial nerve, which is the ocular motor nerve. That's clearly visible. Uh, the trochlear is not visible, but as you look at the side of the uh, sheep brain, there's this really big nerve that's coming off the sides of the pons. So this is the trigeminal nerve. And again, it gets its name for, for its branching pattern. Here's where we can see the first branch coming off, which would be the mandibular nerve. As we come forward, we can see that there, there were actually two branches coming off here. One would have been go going to the upper jaw, the maxilla, and then this one goes to the eye area, the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. That's all of the nerves that you need to find on the sheep brain, the ones that are the most obvious.